Well, good morning, church. It's so good to be in, in the house of the Lord this morning. We're so thankful to be in a place where we can freely meet together. Let's be sure as we worship together this morning, as we open up our time in prayer, let us remember all the other churches throughout all the United States right now. Some are being very pressured to not even do what we're doing here this morning. Yes, we're able to meet together. We're at a, a proper distance. And thank you, church, for uh, for abiding by these guidelines as we navigate through these times. And uh, eventually there's going to be an end. Uh, but let us remember to stay faithful to our Lord. Let us remember to keep him first. And remember why we're meeting together as a church family. So as I pray, will you also pray for all, our, all of our other churches all over the United States who are struggling to even have the opportunity to meet this morning. And so we just want to praise God that we here in Fulton, Indiana, have this great opportunity. But let's open in a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, worship our Lord. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for Fulton Baptist Temple. We thank you for uh, the history of this church. We thank you for uh, Pastor Bruce and for his dear wife. And Lord, as they're uh, navigating through these times with the, the death of their uh, sister-in-law and their sister, I just pray that you just be with that dear family. We pray. God, that you just uh, be with us this morning, help us to focus on you, help us remember why we're meeting here as a church family to ultimately give you glory, to ultimately dig into your word and become disciples of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for your blessing upon the service. We, we pray for a blessing upon the singing and a blessing upon the preaching. Father, we thank you and praise you for this wonderful day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Uh, just... To go along with what Pastor Jeremy said about remembering you know, what we're doing, why we're here with this worship, I wanted to remind us uh, just with a passage here as we start, you know, what we're doing, we might be a relatively small group in a small town that very few people have heard of, but we are joining with millions and billions of people here on the earth who are worshiping our Lord this morning, but also with hosts in heaven. And I wanted to remind us of this picture from Revelation chapter 4. It says, I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven, and I was, and, and in, instantly I was in the spirit, and I saw a throne in heaven, and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian, and the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him, and twenty-four elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder, and in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes front and back. Day after day and night after night, they kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. So worship is happening all the time, and we get to join in that this morning. So let's stand together and worship the Lord God Almighty.
it's good to see you here. It is, you did see Jeremy is here this morning, and uh, his dad and Charlie are here as well, going to be here this week. Um, so they're going to be working in the parsonage, so if you're interested, uh, talk to Aaron, um, and we'll get that all lined up, but they're going to be doing some, replacing some flooring in the kitchen and doing some other stuff there. So um, if you'd like to help with that, if you've got some time this week, um, just let him know, and also be, play, be praying for Tiffany as they're away. Um, and um, also this week, um, if you haven't been watching it, it's, it's really good. Um, the prayer band, the mission prayer band that he's been doing on Tuesday evenings, since he's here, we'll actually do it here at the church. Um, so at 7 o'clock uh, this week on Tuesday, um, you can stop by for that. Are you still going to live stream it too? Nope, we're not going to live stream it, so be here. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a good time and, and a chance to pray together. The last one there, you can see FBT Clubs is scheduled to begin September 16th. Um, there are, it's, it's all up in the air, right? So we'll see. But we're going to plan on being, being together on the 16th with the kids. We have talked about, uh, we had a meeting this last week. There are some special restrictions. We're trying to follow as, as mostly as we can what the school's doing so that it's kind of a little consistent for the kids, consistent for the parents to know what to expect. Um, but in doing this, um, it will, will require more people to be involved. So please pray about that. Um, please, um, you know, if you can do it, it'll be, it's going to be, um, there'll be four kids at a table and um, a chance to go through, um, well, it'll all be laid out for you to go through it with them and to talk with them and to help them understand uh, what's happening there. So please be praying about that. We'll, we'll, we will need more people this year to help. Um, any questions, you can see Aaron. Um, you can talk to Linda or Kristen as well. Linda Wade or Kristen. Any other announcements that need to be added? Yeah, Wendy? All right, you see Wendy and her family is there on the list um, as well. Um, on the back side there, the family of um, Barbara, be Beth's sister, um, they did have that service this week, and they are... I'm assuming still driving on their way home. They were traveling last night, so pray for their safety and for um, just comfort in the next several weeks um, with that. Also, you can see a couple other ones there. Um, Joanne's sister-in-law, and then um, pray for the, keep the Easter Day family as that's a, a change as well with um, Diana and Donna's uh, father there passing. Um, Gloria did have a good surgery. Is she over there? Oh, I see Larry. Nope, there's Larry. Larry, how's it going? Going well, good, good. Um, so that, but that's shoulder surgery is always a, a long recovery. Um, so pray for her in that. Pray for strength in that and for healing in that. Um, Frida is still healing as well. That was a successful surgery. And um, Dave is going to be having surgery here uh, at the end of the month. So maybe, maybe not. Okay. So we'll see how what goes there. But keep praying for that. Um, Teachers and students, it was the first week back. Um, I'm sure it was a little crazy, um, but it sounds like it went okay. And um, just keep praying for that as it's still uncertain all the time. You can see down through the rest of there, there's some other new ones on there. Um, I did see Jake Howdeshell. He is home. Um, he is. He was, came back last week, and um, he said he's home for at least four months. So we'll see um, what, how that works out for him, but it's good that he's back at home here. Any other thing to add to the prayer list? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for this morning and knowing that, um, that you have paid the price for us. That's, that's what you've done. And, and Lord, you've given that as a free gift to us. And Lord, I just pray that you would remind us of that. Lord, that as today that you would, uh, that we would sing to you, that we would, uh, that our hearts would be full of thanksgiving and praise to you. Um, I just pray that you would um, help us through uncertain times, uncharted territories in some places, and that you would continue to bless the going out of your word and the going out of your good news. And um, I just pray for that. I pray for those on the prayer list. We pray for the ones who are uh, hurting, the ones who are in need of your comfort. And Lord, I, I just pray that you, uh, that you would be gracious in that. I just thank you for knowing that you are all of those things. And I thank you for the praises on our list for the, the successful surgeries and for um, the healing and for um, all the different things that we see that you do that are good. And I just, I thank you for that. I, I pray that you would continue in those, that you would continue in, in healing and um, in, in these people on our prayer list. 
Um, and I just thank you for the way that you've given to us. You give us what we need, and you've given us more than what we need in a lot of occasions. And I thank you for um, being able to use that. We give that back to you to use for the, uh, for the expansion of the kingdom, um, to show those around us and to show the world around us um, who you are and what you are like. I just pray for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I love this, uh, this next verse I want to share, just kind of leading into our next song. Uh, it's from Colossians 1, 15 to 20. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Let's stand together and worship the name of Jesus.
Jesus because he first loved me. Sing that chorus again. thank you for the precious, wonderful, perfect sacrifice, the gift of Jesus Christ, for his name, for his glory, for his power, what you've done through him. We thank you, Lord, for including us, for calling us out to be part of that wonderful, wonderful plan for saving us. We worship you for that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Once again, good morning, church. It's good to be with you. Uh, again this morning. If you will, take your Bibles and turn with me to the epistle of James. James chapter 1. James chapter 1 this morning. We're just going to be looking at just a couple of verses. But uh, I want to bring to you a, a series entitled Real Christianity. Uh, this morning during the Sunday school hour, uh, Brother Ken Ham was talking about the foundations that uh, need to be laid before anything else gets built on top of it. If you haven't had a chance already, uh, swing by and, and check out the progress that's going on at the new FBT Center, and you'll, you'll see, you'll wonder, why is, why is nothing being done? Uh, it just looks like they're just pushing dirt around. It looks like just gravel's being poured down. Why can't we just start building on top of it? Well, it takes some time to lay a foundation. It takes some time to make sure that the structure is going to be set. And so as we jump into this series of real Christianity, this is essentially the foundation of our Christian faith. If there's one thing that I'm certain of, is that Christian life is, is seasonal. Do you ever get that way? That the Christian life is seasonal. Some days you're going to just bounce right out of bed. Uh, this morning, my son, he bounced right out of bed, and he went over and knocked over a lamp, scared me half to death, and, well, the air mattress deflated on him, so we're going to have to go to a Walmart and get another one, but he, he jumped right out of bed because something, of course, happened, but similar to our, our Christian life, we just will just bounce right out of bed, and we'll be praising God, and we'll be thanking him for everything that God has done for us, but uh, other days, we're going to struggle to get out of bed. Have you ever felt that way before? Have you ever felt that, I, Lord, I just don't want to get out of bed this morning. I have this coming up. This surgery is going to be taking place. My relative is going through this situation. Lord, this is coming down. I just don't, do not want to get out of bed this morning. And sometimes we think it's just going to be getting worse from there. Well, our, our Christian faith, real Christianity, it is a faith journey. You see, this faith, this journey, it's not going to be visibly measurable, if you will. You're not going to be able to have mathematical sense about it. You can't compute what may be coming down the pipeline. 
and it's not always, and it's going to be experimentally pleasant, but it can be, and it always will be, spiritually hopeful. It will be spiritually hopeful if we have our foundations laid in the proper way. This series, again, it's, it's probably going to be a 13, 14 week long uh, series, so buckle in for it. Uh, this morning we're just going to cover uh, just the four different sections of this particular series. And so really looking forward to diving in with you. But um, before we jump into this series, a couple of questions that are foundationally important to this series, to the understanding of this series. Number one. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? In order to understand what real Christianity is, the first question you must ask is, are you a Christian? In our Bible is James chapter 1. James chapter 1 verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious. We're going to be talking about the difference between our Christian faith and what religion is. And, and sometimes the world has hijacked that word from us. They hijacked the word religion from us. And we often say, which is often true, I don't have a religion, I have a relationship. But religion, that's a Bible word. What we experience on a day-to-day -day basis is a religion. It is a Christian walk with Jesus Christ. And we cannot let that word be hijacked from us. See, we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, yes, but... Our religion, our relationship with Christ is, is based on our faith and trust in him. So one, are you a Christian? I do not simply mean do you use the word Christian in some vague or gratuitous spiritual way. I'm asking about your spiritual destiny. I'm asking, have you taken the time to trust Christ as your personal savior? John chapter 10 and verse number 10 says, I am come that they might have life and that they have it abundantly. See, we often think that eternal life begins when we pass from this earth. We think that eternal life is something far away, that I don't have to think about my eternal life until, you know, maybe I'm on my deathbed or later on in life. And, well, oftentimes we think that's where eternal life is. But John 10.10 10 says, I am come that they might have life. Eternal life began the moment you trusted Christ as your personal Savior. So just be, see, because if you trust Christ as your personal Savior, you will never die. Uh, you've probably heard that saying before, YOLO. How many of you have heard that? Y-O-L-O. -O. How many of you have heard of YOLO before? Well, that's popular among kids and teens. And Well, you only live once. You only live once. So just go out there, YOLO. Let's just jump off this balcony. Let's just do whatever we can because we only live once, so why not just experience everything? Well, as a Christian, that's, that's not necessarily true. I would say, I, I joke with our teens and sometimes uh, try to uh, keep up with their lingo. Oftentimes, uh, I'm not, you know, I'm old to them. But I would say, yo do, y o d o, you only die once. If you're a Christian, you only die once. See, because eternal life began the moment you trusted Christ as your personal Savior. So eternal life can begin for you now. If, if, you can, if you answer that question, are you a Christian? If you say no, well, something can change in your heart today. Eternal life can begin for you now. You can be just like in James chapter 1. This epistle can be written for you. If you said, if I asked the question, are you a Christian? And you say in your mind, I don't believe I am. I don't think I am. Well, you can have this religion. You can say, as James says, if any man among you seem to be religious, you can trust Christ as your personal savior this morning. Or are you trusting in this so-called religion? Are you just trusting in the fact that I've attended church this many years, I've, I've done this for the church, I've done this for people, and so that's what I'm counting on to get me into heaven. Or I'm counting on my good works, I'm counting on my observations, I've taken the Lord's Supper every single time the church offered it. So that means that I'm, I'm a Christian. Are you trusting in that, or are you trusting in that moment when you went before the Lord and said, Lord, I am a sinner, 
I, I have sinned against you. I've inherited that sin nature from Adam, just like what we learned this morning in Sunday school. That foundational truth that for as by one man sin entered into the world, and so death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And we say, that's me today. That's me. I have sinned against you. There is this great chasm between me and the Lord, and I do not think that I'm a Christian this morning. If we can say that for certain, if we can say, I don't think so, get that settled in your heart this morning because this series then is for you. This epistle that James was writing to the scattered believers um, everywhere after the persecution, he was writing to Christians and he was saying, Christian, sometimes you're not acting like it and here's how to fix it. So that's what we're going to be learning in these next 13, 14, 15, 20 weeks or so. We have all the time in the world until the Lord comes back. We may be in the book of James. But the question is, are you a Christian? If you are putting your faith and trust in nothing but yourself or in your, your religion and not the, the fact that, that God came to seek and to save that which is lost, and that was you, that was me, and once you put your faith in him, you, are, you have become a Christian. Again, if you're trusting in anything else other than the saving grace of Jesus Christ, your observance of just religion will not give you eternal life that Jesus was saying there in John chapter 10, verse 10. Real Christianity is to truly be a Christian, is to have that faith and trust in Jesus Christ. The second question I would like to ask you, first question was, are you a Christian? The second question I would like to ask you is, if you are a Christian, do you really understand and enjoy your Christian life? Again, that question is this, if you are a Christian, do you understand what it means to be saved? Do you understand what it is to have real Christianity? And do you enjoy your Christian life? I'm not saying are you happy all the time. See, because happiness is, is lateral. It's this way. You say something comes up, a bill comes up I wasn't expecting. I'm not happy about it. When we first moved to Massachusetts, uh, there's something called an excise tax. Do you all have an excise tax down here? Praise God for that. I'm not going to give your governors any ideas then. But up in Massachusetts, if you own a vehicle, not only do you get taxed on that when you purchase it, but because you have the opportunity to be able to afford this vehicle, we're going to tax you on that as well. And see, we arrived in, in Massachusetts with a little 2005 Dodge Neon, barely made it there, and we were excited to have a car, but that thing would give us nothing but problems. It would always have a bill every single month because of the things we had to do and work on it. And so we decided, you know, there was some, some serious front-end problems, and we decided that it's time to get rid of this thing because it's costing us so much money, and rather than invest into this, we'll just start with a monthly payment. So we went, and of course, the thing to get in New England was a Subaru. You had to get a Subaru because the winners were just terrible. Everyone either owned a Jeep or a Subaru. And so we thought, well, we might as well get a, a Subaru and with all wheel drive so that we make sure we're safe and whatnot. Well, I wasn't expecting the excise tax the next year. And so we're in ministry, we're, we're, we're paying our bills on time, and then all of a sudden this, this bill comes, and boy, we were not happy about it. We were not happy about what was coming our way, and that's often how we, we, we think. We think that if, if I have joy, that means I have to be happy all the time. Well, again, that's happiness. Again, it's based on your circumstances. Whereas joy, if you have joy in your Christian life, that's your relationship with God. See, joy is based on how close you are with God. It's, it's vertically, if you will. Again, happiness goes this way. Joy goes this way. The closer you are to God is the closer and the more joy you will have and be fulfilled. And so if you're not enjoying your Christian faith, if you're not enjoying your Christian walk with God, this series is for you. We will be looking at what it means to be a Christian. We'll be looking at what James is saying here of, of having this, this, this religion. So this, again... Uh, the question being, if you are a Christian, do you understand and enjoy your Christian life? From the first moment of faith until the moment you see Jesus Christ, it's easy for us to get off course, is it not? It's easy for us to see something come up 
again, when we think, well, I've got to be happy all the time. Well, if I'm not happy, that means uh, something is seriously lo- wrong with my relationship with God. Well, that's not necessarily true. Again, your joy. Where is your joy? You can have joy, but you can also not be happy during that time, but you can still be joyful. Remember what Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And we say to Paul, Paul, how can you be so brash to say that? Do you not understand what's going on in my heart and in my life today? How can I have joy in that? And again, we're, our, our thoughts of joy is misguided because we often think it's based on our circumstances, but it's not. So we can rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You know, confusion and discouragement, they often abound among Christians and it often creeps into our life. But hopefully this series will help us to avoid those pitfalls. Somewhere between meeting Jesus and seeing him face to face, we experience the, the, this difficulty of being in him. We, we face this difficulty of being a Christian. Sometimes our joy can be replaced with anxiety. Sometimes the grace that we've experienced in our life can be overshadowed by some perceived expectations. Sometimes we just decide to get this Christian faith all backwards and, and not surprisingly we become miserable on what it is to be joyful and experience this exciting journey. So as we dive in this first message of real Christianity, I would like us to just look at four different ideas of real Christianity. Number one will obviously be what is real Christianity. Number two will be the real gospel, the the real gospel and what that means to us. Thirdly, we'll look at what it is to be renewed in him, real renewal. And then lastly, we're going to look at real hope. So this, this message is just going to be an overview of these four important subjects. And as the weeks to come, we'll dive into all four of them. But just an overview of what is real Christianity. Taking this text, let us look at this text of James chapter 1 and see what it is to be a real Christian. Real Christianity. Verse number 26 of James chapter 1. If any man among you seem to be religious, or in our case, if any of you among you seem to have real Christianity, and you bridle not your tongue, you're deceiving your own heart. This man's religion is vain. The term Christian has been redefined in recent centuries and years, but we're going to look to return to the basic understanding of what real Christianity is. Where did it all come from? What does it mean? What does it mean in the Bible and What does it mean to not just merely have tradition? A lot of times we get focused on what tradition is. That if we're not following through traditions, then that's probably not real Christianity. So this passage here, uh, Paul, or I'm sorry, James is telling the, the, the people here that are scattered throughout that if you think yourself to be religious, if you think yourself to have this Christianity, but you're not holding back on, the, on the, the thing that you can control, your tongue, you're deceiving your own heart. And Paul is, or James is saying here, this man's religion is worthless. It's vanity. If we cannot uh, control ourselves, if we cannot have even the, the basic self-control, then what we're doing again, even though we may have a, an understanding and even though we may be in Jesus Christ, but if we're spouting off, if we're, if we're not controlling our tongue, as James is saying here, this man's religious religion is vain. Christianity just becomes vanity, becomes empty, becomes worthless to our co-workers, to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family. For example, at, uh, at camp we have a big cotton candy machine and kids get so excited about it. You get a stick and it, I mean, there's... Some of our workers really pal on the cotton candy and big old mountain of cotton candy. And those kids, they they dive right into it. They get a big old handful of it, stick it in their mouth, and almost instantly it's gone. That's vanity, right? That's how how the world works. And there's sin out there, and we as Christians, we think, okay, I'm just going to grab it all in. I'm going to take it all in. 
because that's, that seems to be the cool thing to do. That seems to be what my, my body really wants to do. And, and you gobble it all up and it's vanity. It's empty. But real Christianity is, is, is all about self-control. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. We all know Charles Spurgeon. Well, he writes about this particular passage. He says this, Religion does not consist simply in meeting together for prayer. It does not mean meeting together by singing hymns or hearing sermons. There is much of this that is profitable. Christianity, it's profitable to have prayer, singing hymns, worship, hearing sermons. It's profitable. It also glorifies God, but... There is something more wanted in a complete, real worship of God. When you and I live daily with the fear of God before our eyes, in the presence of men of the world, who care not whether there is a God or, or not, then we are truly manifesting pure and undefiled religion. When we judge all our conduct by thinking how it will appear in the sight of God, when assailed by temptation, we say to ourselves, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? When we keep ourselves apart from every evil thing that it might entice us, saying, so do not I, but because of the fear of God, that is true worship quite as real worship as the hymns we sing and the prayers we offer. To summarize this, again, we must conduct ourselves as in the knowledge, knowing that God sees everything we do. How should we think that this will appear before our creator? How do we think, if I'm about to do this, if I'm about to act this way, if I'm about to say this thing to this person, as James is writing here, if, I'm, if somebody says something to me and, and I lash back out to them, how is that going to appear in the sight of God? Is, is my religion, is my relationship with God going to be empty? Is it going to be worthless? Is it going to be vanity? If we spout back to them, then it will be. How is this going to appear in the sight of God? And when we get that truth, that's when we'll understand what real Christianity is. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, control that tongue, control that mouth, self-control, but deceiveth his own heart, this man religion is vain. Real Christianity is about self-control. Real Christianity is how is this going to appear in the sight of God? Because we have real Christianity now, the second part of this series, we're going to be looking at the real gospel. The real gospel. What is the gospel message? Now that we know what Christianity is, now that we know that it's a relationship with Jesus Christ, as being Christians, we have the opportunity to spread the real gospel. We have the opportunity to be good stewards of his grace. Last time I was here, we, we looked at that very important passage in 1 Peter. And being a steward, God has given us this opportunity to, to tend to this garden, if you will, of unbelievers. And giving us the opportunity to, to promote the gospel to them. This gospel will explore whether Christianity is a religion or it's this relationship. It's, and again, when we look at the, the foundational truth of religion, when I, when I first said religion here in, in this particular sentence, I'm talking about this, this man-made idea of what religion is all about. And again, we cannot let the world hijack that word from us. But when I say um, whether Christianity is this man-made structure of ideas, I could say, or is it a relationship with Jesus Christ? Each lesson, each message will help us to break away from the traditional man's ideas of what religion is all about and have that as our anchor, but help us to return to the biblical concept of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, this section of our series will um, lay a fresh foundation you know, even if you've known Jesus for a long time, you say, Pastor Jeremy, uh, I've been a Christian now for 50 years. Uh, I know uh, what my faith is all about. Why do I need this, this, this foundational truth? Well, even if you've known Jesus for five minutes or 50 years, 
This section is, is important for us to know. It's important for us to have that, again, that, that basic foundation and that truth. And it's always a great reminder. One of my favorite passages to preach from is John 3.16. You say, I memorized that when I was five. Why, why should I hear another message out of John 3.16? Well, quickly, it says, for God. Who's God? We have to have a basic understanding of God. And to do that, we also have to have a basic understanding of Genesis. For God so loved. What is love? Well, love is an action. For God so loved the world. Who's the world in this, in this uh, verse? Is it the, the trees, the mountains, the, the earth that we walk on? No, the world is you. The world is your unbeliever, being, unbelieving friends, your unbelieving relatives. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave a precious gift to us. He gave his only begotten son, his one-of-a-kind son, that whosoever, again, that's you, that this gospel message is for everyone, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have that everlasting life. And like John 10.10 says, that eternal life can begin now. Eternal life begins the moment that you've trusted Jesus Christ. That's the gospel message. A gospel-centered religion will permit us to visit the fatherless and the needs of the widows, as we're about to read in James 1, verse 27. It says, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the orphans, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Where they are, not in some destination where they will be, but no, our pure religion, our undefiled gospel, real gospel is meeting people where they are, going to them, meeting with them, ministering to them. And that's what the real gospel is going to focus on. A man-centered religion will focus on following a strict set of rules. I'm going to read just a couple of passages from Luke chapter 11. And uh, this is the, the, the Pharisees and Jesus just going back and forth. They're fighting and, and uh, Jesus finally rebukes them. And th this is a woe passage. We often may say that. But um, here in verse 37 of Luke chapter 11, As he spake, a certain Pharisee besought him to dine with him. And he went in and sat down to meet. And when the Pharisee saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Here again, here's a strict set of rules. No, the Pharisees, they said, you have to wash. That is a tradition that we're not going to give up. You have to wash. It's not just for cleanliness, but it's a tradition. You must wash yourself before dinner. And the Lord said unto him, Now do ye Pharisee make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but your inward part is full of ravening and wickedness? See, Jesus did not hold back on this Pharisee. He said, you're, you're a whited sepulcher here. You may be beautiful on the outside, you might be cleaned on the outside, but you are full of dead bones. Jesus did not hold back. And then as we... Uh, Look in verse 40, ye fools, not only did he insult them by saying that your, your inward part is full of wickedness, he's calling them fools here. Did not he that made which is without make that which is within also? But rather give alms of such things as ye have, and behold, all things are clean unto you. And then he gets into the woe passage here. But woe unto you, Pharisee, for ye tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and Passover judgment. And the love of God. You're giving all these things, but you're forgetting the love of God, which is the simple truth of the real gospel. You're forgetting what this whole message is all about. Woe unto you, Pharisee, verse 43. And again in verse 44, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. He calls them hypocrites. So our Lord Jesus, not only does he say that they're, part of, uh, that they're full of wickedness, he calls them fools, and then he also calls them hypocrites hypocrites. Jesus is saying that Pharisees, you've destroyed the message of the real gospel. You have made it into this strict set of rules, these strict set of traditions. I have to do this. I have to do that in order to be closer with God. But that's not it. Jesus is saying you're fools for believing that. You're hypocrites for doing these things. You're as graves which appear not and the men that walk over them are not aware of them. People all over are just walking and saying, wow, those Pharisees, those are good people. And Jesus is saying, I see right through that. You're forgetting the real gospel. 
You're forgetting what it means to be a believer. And uh, that's uh, our, our desire with this series is to look at the real gospel, is to look at what real Christianity is and talking about how it's, it's a relationship with him and that it's not just following a strict set of rules and, and traditions to try to get closer with God. No, those are, those are all um, um, characteristics of what it goes on inside. If we're setting up standards, standards if we're st- setting up rules in our homes, then that's because of what's already happened on the inside. And then we set up those barriers for our children and for uh, those that are within our home. See, the, the Pharisees, they may had a conviction on themselves and they, just, they desired to cast that conviction on everyone else and saying, no, this is what you must do. But forgetting the gospel, forgetting the meaning of what it is to have uh, the gospel in their hearts. And then uh, Jesus just blasts these Pharisees for, for forgetting the real gospel. Back to our passage in, in, uh, in James chapter 1. So what is the real gospel? Well, the real gospel is meeting the fatherless, meeting those uh, orphans, meeting those that are without, that have so little, meeting the needs of our widows, meeting the needs of the elderly within our church, meeting the needs of where they are, helping them as best as we can and as much as we can. That's what the real gospel is all about. That's what real Christianity is all about. Then the the third topic in which we'll dive into, it's renewal, real renewal. In this section, we're going to dig deeper into practical daily Christian living, the day-to-day things of our Christian faith. And we're going to make disciples of ourselves. We're going to understand biblical principles that will help us to enjoy the journey of walking with Jesus Christ. It's a joy to walk with him. I've had so much fun as a Christian. Uh, we don't need the, the things of the world to entertain us, to, to get us to a point where we enjoy our, our life. No, we can enjoy our life in Jesus Christ. We can um, keep ourselves unstained or unspotted as uh, James chapter 1, verse 27. We saw that the real gospel is meeting the needs of others to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. And the second part of of this, to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's what renewal is all about. That's what real renewal is, is, uh, is all about, that to keep ourselves unspotted, to be unblemished. Um, the, the picture of the lamb coming to the altar, being slain for, for the, the forgiveness of our sins, it was always the whitest lamb, the, the one that was without spot, that was one without any blemish. We know this from the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, and how uh, they would... Uh, groom these, these lambs just for that very moment. And of course, then they would slaughter and, and sprinkle the blood on, on the altar. And then Jesus Christ being, uh, that's, that was just a simple picture of the Christ to come. Jesus being perfectly spotless, sinless, without any sin, suffered and died on the cross for our sins. Became that spotless lamb for us. And then here, this passage in James is telling us to have renewal, to have a uh, practical daily Christian life means to keep ourselves unspotted, to be unblemished, or also it means to be unstained by the world. First John chapter 2 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that's not of the Father, but it is of the world. The world's going to pass by, the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Real renewal. And then the last section of our, uh, of the series that we're going to look at is entitled Real Hope. Real Hope. We know what real Christianity is. We're going to observe the real gospel and, and what that means to be saved. We're going to see what it means to live a practical Christian life. But then we're going to observe what real hope is all about. We're going to discover what God says about handling our struggles and our hardships. We'll see the big picture of where this is all going. We'll find out why the Christian life is worth living. We have so much hope as Christians. When we lose someone, when things affect us, 
We get so much comfort in knowing that we'll see our relative again. Do you not? When your loved ones pass on, when, when things come up in your life and you say, th- I can't do it without Jesus Christ. That's what real hope is all about. We have that hope and we have that faith in knowing that everything's going to get better. It may be tough for a season, but God is going to strengthen me to that task. When we lost our, our, our little Rosalind when she was a stillborn, we, uh, one of my pastor friends said to me, he says, you've probably heard this before, that God will never give you more than you can handle. Well, that's not true. God always gives you more than you can handle. But what he does, he strengthens you to that task. He builds you up to that and helps you to overcome. And that's what hope is all about, that God will lift you up. God will strengthen, your, strengthen you to overcome those difficulties. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great of cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. As the book of Hebrews tells us, that sin that clings so closely to us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and now is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That is our hope. That's our hope in him. Jesus has already run the race. It's now time for us to follow him. Follow after him. He's already defeated death. He's already defeated the grave. Now it's us up to us to follow him. And that's what we're going to look at. And that's what we're going to see. The real hope of Jesus Christ. I'm excited about this series. I'm excited to dive in with you over the next, like I said, 14, 20, 25, whoever, however many weeks it is. Bear with me. Uh, I get really excited about things, and so I hope that in return uh, that you all get excited as well, that as we dive into what it means to be a real Christian, again, this may seem so elementary, but it's so important. We can never be reminded of the gospel enough. The gospel is the way in which we should live our life. It's the foundational truth. And so let us, let us build up our foundation so that whenever anything comes our way, we can see the hope of Jesus Christ and and get through. Uh, Again, church, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm excited to spend the next, this week and next week with you. And again, church, please do keep uh, my family in prayer, keep my wife in prayer this week. And, uh, and, and again, if, if you are, are not doing anything this week, please feel free to come see me and uh, we'll, we'll try to, to get as much on the parsonage done as possible. But uh, again, looking forward to diving into this series with you, looking forward and being here full time. And uh, that should come at the last week of October. Uh, again, we have some obligations we have to follow through with uh, at our current place of residence. Uh, so again, church, it's so good to be with you this week and next. And again, we covet your prayers. We need your prayers. Church, God loves you. I love you. Let's have a word of prayer. And then you are dismissed. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for the truth in knowing that we can have the hope in Jesus Christ. That Jesus has already won those battles for us. Help us now to follow through with him. Help us to learn what it means to be a real Christian. And Father, thank you for James. Thank you for him writing to the the scattered believers and telling us what it means to be a real Christian. Help us now to apply this to our, our lives this week. Help us to come back stronger with you next Sunday. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. You all have a great day.